to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Good greasy chicken. What a surprising day in the kingdom. God is just multiplying and I'm not even aware of it. <laughs> that just wore you out knowing it now, doesn't it? <laughs> She's going, ay, 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 ay. We're not even Spanish. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> Talk to Jesus, one of his <laughs> You can tell it's going to be one of those mornings, can't you? First Peter chapter 4. The title to this session is called Refining Faith. Amen. Refining Faith. Um, I really felt led of the Lord to do this. As we enter into the new year, I want to make you aware of a couple of things and, and for us to just really grow and mature in the things of God and, and uh, you know, just really walk in the blessings and the abundance that, that God has for us. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, I'll use several translations. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Everybody say fiery trial. 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 Say it one more time. Fiery trial. Fiery trial, which is to try you. Not the person next to you, but you. Okay? As though something strange has happened unto you. The phrase fiery trial in the Greek is pyrosis, is where we get the word like pyromaniac or pyro from, setting things on fire. And it means to set on fire. So basically what we're saying, don't, don't, don't think it's a strange thing when all of a sudden you're set on fire. Because you're going to be going through a test. Now, fire is not, woohoo, let's go do it. Fire is, oh man, everything in my life is falling apart. The word fiery trial, I want to give you some definitions because it's very relevant to what we're going to be talking about. It means, number one, smelting. Everybody say smelting. That does not mean first person who smelt it dealt it. That's not what it's talking about, okay? But smelting, everybody say smelting, means to extract metal from its ore, okay, by heat and melting. Now, what is God looking for in our lives? Well, what are we being judged by? We are going to be judged by whether our works are wood, hay, stubble, silver, and gold. So God wants to extract the silver and gold that's in us. Anything else gets burned up in the smelting process. Now, gold is symbolic of saints who have gone through hell and back but stood on the word of God. That's what gold is. Turn to somebody and say, I'm a gold member. Silver means you've gone, through the, you've gone through some stuff and you held on to the word. But every now and then, for maybe for a season, you just kind of let go. But then you came back around and you held on. That's silver. Everybody say gold and silver. So God does this. You've got to realize anything we produce, we don't get to keep. God always pulls that from us, that, that fruit. For example, if you're bearing much fruit, if you're doing wonderful things for God, the Bible says Jesus is going to come along and he's going to prune that branch. He's going to cut it because you're producing such good stuff. And when you prune a branch, what happens? You grow back twice as strong with twice as much fruit. So God is into collecting the things that we do in our life. Everybody say he's a collector. The word fiery trial also means a conflagration. What is a conflagration? That means something is on fire and the fire just keeps spreading. It just keeps spreading and spreading and spreading. You're going through one thing. All of a sudden, this one thing has affected this thing. Now you've got two fires going. Now you've got these two fires going. Both of these affected this thing. And now you've got another fire going on. And all hell has broke loose. Turn to somebody and say, it's okay to say hell in church. It's in the Bible. The word fiery trial also means a calamity as a test, okay? An event that causes damage or distress. What does that mean? That means sometimes we're going to go through stuff that we think is going to knock us out of the game. I just can't do this no more. I'm tired of it. Why, do, why did this happen to me? And so it's a calamity and a distress. Now, this didn't come from God. But what the devil intended for evil, Genesis uh, uh, 5020, what the devil intended for evil, God will turn around for your good. Okay? So, what happens is when we go through a fiery trial, we, ha we have a tendency to jump to conclusion that God's not on the job. Hello, hello, God, God, where, where, are, are, you, you, you. And so we pray, we rebuke, we bind, and nothing happens. 
Okay? And that's exactly what the devil wants us to think. Now, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. God is telling us his attitude when we go through stuff. How many of you know life is rough? Here's something I'm learning, okay? Getting old is not for the weak. You know, we think the young ones got it all going on and stuff like that, but getting old is not for the weak. You try getting out of bed without moaning and creaking and, and grinding and everything else, going up some steps, carrying loads of laundry and stuff. Now, notice this is what the attitude God tells us to have. And it's easy to write it, but it's hard to live it. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. Everybody say glad. So this is what it, this really is that we go through sometimes is what the devil intended to knock us out of the game. God turns it into a spiritual refining process. Now, the word refining means to remove impurities or unwanted elements from, to remove impurities. Every one of us, uh, we go through things and we find out that there's something in us that we hadn't discovered before. We find out another attribute of God, another characteristic of God, another way that God does things. And so when we go through stuff, okay, it didn't start from God, we know that, but God will use that in order to pull out the impurities. Another way of saying impurities is the things that tend to get in the way of our relationship with God. Sometimes we have things getting in the way. The thing that gets in the way most today in churches is that the church is putting on the, the, the mantle of the world. We're becoming no different than the world. Okay? Now, thank you for that amen. The word refining means to make minor changes as to improve uh, a theory or a method. How many of you know you're not today what you were when you first got started? You've went through some improvement. You've went through some changes. So what the devil intended for evil, God says, well, I'll go ahead and turn that around, and I'll make it work for your good, okay? Because it says that we're partakers of Christ's suffering. What does that mean? That means Jesus went through the same stuff we've gone through, and the reason he went through it is so that when you and I start going through it, he can lead us. He can show us the way. This is how you handle this thing. Now, let's go on to the next verse, and I want to show you something else. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. So fiery trials, we go through difficult times. There are times when it seems like all hell has broke loose. No matter where we look, the fire is on, the heat is on. And what we do in the middle of, the, of that heat has a lot to determine. But I want to expose to you Satan's strategy on how he begins to pick apart at believers to the point where you just want to just give up and quit. See, Satan's number one objective is to look at your life and to see where can I get you to doubt? Can I hit you? I know what it is. I'll just ask everybody to turn it off so it wouldn't interfere with the service. Can I get you, can I hit you in your finances and will you fall apart? Can I hit you in your health, and will you fall apart and start doubting that God's word is real? Can I hit you in the area of relationships, and if I hit you in the area of your relationships, it makes it seem like no one's paying attention to you, you'll never get married, you're getting too old, everything's dropping south, who's going to be interested in you? By now, you are set in your ways. What can I do to get you to doubt? And there's something amongst every one of us where if we got hit in that area we would doubt before we would believe God. To some people, they have no problem believing for healing. Others have wrestled with healing because they prayed for healing, stood for healing, and it didn't seem like God was doing anything. Some people, you can attack, the devil can attack them financially, and they just lose it. Are you getting this? They begin to take matters at their own hands. They shake fists at God. I give tithe and offerings. Some people, it, it, it's in the area of trust and confidence. And so what Satan does is he goes around as a roaring lion looking, looking. He's looking for something in you that he can use and say, how can I get to you? Maybe if I attack your children. 
will you lose it then? What if I attack your relationship, your marriage? Will you lose it then? Will you doubt God then? And so he's looking for that area that he can hit us with. He's not going to hit us where we're strong. You can't attack me with finances because I've been through the financial test. I've seen what God can do at the last moment. Now, in the area of healing, that would be a weak spot for me. Some of you, it may be healing. It may be relationship. To a lot of people, it's your children. The enemy will attack a mother. Hey, I'm going to hit your child. And I'm going to hit him so hard, you're going to doubt that God's word is going to be able to pull you through this thing. And I want you to see this. 1 Peter chapter 5. Be sober. That's the, that's the Greek word Sophia. Be, be wise. Be vigilant. Be alert. Be on guard. Because your adversary, the person sitting next to you, is your problem. No, that's not what it says. Our adversary, our enemy, is the devil. Okay? Now, the devil will try to do things through people, but, you know, the devil will try to do things to people even who consider themselves Christian. Well, I don't know about that. Well, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. And Peter was a believer, but he was under this influence. Are you getting any of this? So be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. So seeking means he has to have permission. So what he'll do is he'll look for areas in our life that he can hit us with. I want to hit you so hard with this, I'm going to cause your faith to go on trial. Do you really believe what you say you believe? Do you really believe God is your provider? If God's your provider, how come you're broke? If God's your provider, where's the money? If God's your provider, why are they repossessing your car? If God's your provider, how come you got another pink slip in, in the mail that they're going to cut off your utilities? If God's your provider. If God is your healer, how come they want to schedule surgery? Why doesn't he just whiz bang and heal it? If God is your protection, how come your children are acting out and running more with the world and the devil than they are coming to the house of God? And so in each, every one of us, he's going to try to target something because he's looking for something. Where in your life can I get you to doubt? How can I build up disappointment? Frustration. Bitterness, hatred, animosity. What can I do to get you to isolate yourself so you won't fellowship? You'll stop coming to church. You'll be angry. You won't do the things that you did as a Christian when you first got saved. What can I do? How can I hit you? And so that's what the enemy is looking for. So I'm going to give you six things that begins the enemy begins to target in our life that is a deterioration process. Because he's out to kill, steal, and destroy. Turn to somebody and say, the devil is your enemy, not God. So the devil is looking for a place in our lives. How can I hit you, okay, so I can get you to doubt? Some people are, they have confidence that God is a healer. Some people just don't know because they didn't experience healing or somebody they know died. Some people are confident that God's a supplier. Those that don't, they want to have garage sales, bake sales, and, 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 you know, sell cookies on the corner. Some people are confident that they can put their children into God's hand, and when they get older, they'll not depart. And, and, and some people just take matters into their own hand and make matters worse and cause more stress and everything else. But everybody has something. So I want to show you the six things that the enemy targets. Number one... He's out to steal your love. Everybody say love. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 38. And I am convinced that nothing can separate us <clears throat> from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. See, 
God, Satan cannot alter God's love for us, but he can alter your love for God. I've known people who were solid Christians doing good, and then their mama died, and their daddy died, and because their mama died and their daddy died, and God didn't keep them alive, they no longer go to church, and they don't believe God. The love is gone. So God still loves them, but they no longer love God. Go with me to the next verse, verse 39. Nor powers in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed, nothing in all of creation uh, will ever be able to separate us from the love, everybody say love, love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The enemy will do anything he can to get you to believe that God doesn't love you. And he'll do it through disappointments, discouragement. He'll do it with interferences and hindrances. You're expecting something and it's taking longer than what you thought. All of a sudden, you feel like you're hidden. God's not listening. No one's paying attention. And so what does it begin to do to, to your mentality? Well, what it does, you begin to talk yourself into thinking, well, maybe God doesn't love me, or maybe I messed up. And so what we have a tendency to do is we start blaming God. God must not be on the job. I must be that one exception to the rule. Out of all the billions of people that have lived over the years, I'm that one exception to the rule. God doesn't love me no more. Or, you know what? My mama died. I'm tired of God. That's it. I've had it. Uncle Fred died. I'm tired of God. Here I am busting my tail. I'm trying to live the life. I'm trying to do something for the kingdom. And this is the thanks I get. I quit. I'm not going back no more. What did he do? He attacked your love for God. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Everybody say, yay. Yeah, it tells us to rejoice when problems happen. Yay. Oh, I'm going through something. Yay. Hey, how you doing, brother? Yay. Okay, when we go through problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop what? Endurance. If you're taking notes, write this down. True love endures. Love endures. What does that mean? They put up with it. They put up with it. They put up with it. They, they may not be able to explain it. I don't get it. I don't understand. But our society has become such a society that if that person doesn't make me happy no more, I can just get a divorce and replace them. But true love endures. You know, there's brothers and sisters and Lord, couples who've been married for years and years and years. They were in love at one time, but now, you know, through a series of circumstances, they live in the same household, but they don't love each other. Why? Well, they turned their love from focusing outward to their love on focusing inward. Now it's all about them and theirs. Everybody say them and theirs. So when people stop loving those around them, their endurance has failed. Because love endures. So when you stop loving people around you, okay, your endurance has failed. Life becomes all about you and yours. Turn to someone and say, I know he's not talking about me. And they have forgotten the virtues of forgiveness and love and grace and mercy. What happened? Well, their love didn't endure. Now they're in survival mode. Now they're constantly looking at their spouse and their behaviors instead of looking at themselves and looking at God saying, I'm going to forgive, I'm going to love unconditionally, I'm going to keep on going. And so when your love no longer endures, Satan has stolen your love because now you can't stand people. Now people get on your nerves. People terrify you. And so what's happened? He's stolen your love. The love is gone. You go through the motions... You put on a mask, it's called hypocrisy. You put on a face, yes, amen, hallelujah. But in reality, you can't wait to hide in your closet at home because you just can't stand people no more. What happened? Well, he stole your love. And so we maintain an outward appearance of having a type of relationship with Jesus, 
the Bible says that's going to be one of the signs in the last days, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And so we isolate ourselves. Why? Just can't put up with people's behaviors no more. Love is not enduring. So the impurities that needs to be smelted away, okay, from the surface, uh, from, from, from it within that person comes to the surface. Remember, it's a fiery trial. That trial, is a, just, the devil is attacking your love. So what happens? What comes to the surface? Well, now you can find hatred. You can find bitterness. You can find sarcasm. You can find hurtful words. Just cutting people down with hurtful words. You give people the silent treatment. What happened? The devil stole your love. And so that's one of his objectives. If he can steal your love, he can steal your joy. And then we begin to spiral downward. Can I give you the next step? Look at someone and say, I'm glad that's never happened to me. The second thing the enemy wants after he steals your love is he wants to steal your praise. Everybody say praise. In the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. And, and in, instruct and direct one another, okay, using good common sense. And sing, sing your hearts out. When the love is gone, that song in your heart isn't there anymore. I've witnessed this in people who, who used to come to church. God delivered them out of serious dilemmas and legal issues. And they got radically saved and they got on fire. And you would call them on their cell phone. And, 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 and while you were on hold, this Christian music would be blaring. They had that song in their heart. Then when they backslid and fell away and you'd call them up, now there's the honky-tonk song. There's the drinking song. There's the fornication song playing on their phone. What happened? Well, the enemy stole their praise. It affected their love for God. They're no longer walking with God. And now their praise is gone. And Colossians right here tells us that you and I, we should have a song in our heart. We should praise him. Singing unto him. If you sing to your steering wheel, why not to Jesus? So when you try, to, let me tell you how you can tell your praise has been stolen or is getting stolen. When you try to get something out of praise and worship, your praise has become stolen. When you come to get something out of praise and worship, your praise has been stolen. Because we don't come to praise and worship for you to get something out of it. We come for praise and worship so we can give something to him. And so when the song services, now you're rating and judging the songs, or you don't like the way they're singing it, you want it sung the old-fashioned way, the way that you heard it when you first heard it, and you begin to critique it, what happened? Well, the enemy's stealing your praise. That song is no longer in your heart. And he wants to steal your praise. Now, go with me to the Song of Solomon's. Turn to somebody and say, that's a book in the Bible. When your praise has been stolen, praise and worship becomes about the songs that you like and how you like them. I don't like that song. It's not for you. Huh? And so you no longer see it as an intimate rendezvous with Jesus. Everybody say rendezvous. Now I want to show you a song of Solomon. It's a, it's a love story. It's, it's pretty erotic if we translate it in today's language. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 6. Here's what happens to a believer. But when I opened the door, who's the door? But when I opened the door, he was gone. My loved one was tired of waiting and left. And I died inside. Oh, I felt so bad. I ran out looking for him, but he was nowhere to be found. I called unto into the darkness, but he didn't answer. When you lose your praise, that's what it's like. You try to get into that moment. You try to get into that song and let it affect you like it used to affect you. And you're crying out to him. And he's not there no more. The praise 
the intimacy, the rendezvous is not taking place. Why? Because you go and you're giving him lip service, but the love is gone. There's coming a time when, when Jesus said, these people worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from it. And so now you see people, what am I in God we serve? What am I in God we serve? But it's not in them. It's lip service. It'd be kind of like, yeah, yeah, I love you. When I quit loving you, I, I'll, I'll let you know. Try that on your wife and see how well you'll do that day. And so in the Song of Solomon, I, I opened the door. I, I tried to get in there, and I, I was looking for my lover. I was looking for Jesus, the lover of my soul. I, I so desperately wanted to connect, but I, 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 I cried out to him. But he didn't answer. He got tired of waiting on me. Why? Because the love is gone. The love is gone. And so now it affected my praise. And so now when I come to church, I don't get nothing out of it. Just going through the motions. They're just filling time. Yeah, yeah, shut up, sit down, let's go. I've got stuff to do. What happened? The love is gone. And that love affected your praise. And so what we need to do is we need to open the door to our hearts and initiate. We need to find our praise again. Okay? How, how can you, uh, what do you pray? You will only praise what you value. Are you getting this? And so when he's not the first thing in your life, how many of you know Jesus said he's a jealous God? When he's not first in your life and other things begin to take more place, What's going on? The enemy, as a roaring lion, found something to steal from you. The third thing that the devil looks for once he steals your love and your praise is your vision. Everybody say vision. When your love and your praise is gone, your vision begins to deteriorate. Go with me to the book of Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 9. Turn to someone and say, yes, Lamentations is a book in the Bible. Lamentations means weeping. The prophet Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations, and he was weeping over Israel. It, they, Israel had just become so destitute, so ravished. They've gone through so much, and, and so they begin to replace God with things and activities and other stuff. It's no different than what some Christians do today. Now they can't come to church because they're out there playing golf or they're duck hunting or, or you know, there's a sale going on or we're staying at home and, and, and this and that. It's no different today than it was back then. It's just, you know, the, the, the culture has changed. In the book of Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 9, the message translation, talking about Jerusalem. Her city gates, iron bars and all, disappeared in the rubble. What does that mean to you and I? Well, now, the, now you're vulnerable to the enemy. Your protection is gone. Okay? Her kings and her princes off to exile. No one left to instruct or lead. Her prophets useless. Now listen to this. Here's what happens when you lose your vision. They neither saw nor heard anything from God. Even their prophets wasn't getting anything from God. They had grown such a lifestyle where they put everything in front of God that when came time for, you know, where they really needed God, and then all of a sudden they gave them that last minute attention, they tried to seek God, and they couldn't see nothing. They couldn't hear nothing. They didn't know what to do. Why? Because I went to the door, and I called out for my lover, Jesus! Lover of my soul, where are you? Well, I'm far from you. Why? Because it's just lip service. And so when there's no love and there's no praise, you get to the point where you're not hearing from God anymore. You're not sure if this vision is going to come about. Well, you know, they prophesied to me that I was supposed to be an entrepreneur. But I don't see that happening. You know, they prophesied that, that God was going to bring my children from the north, the south, the east, the west out of darkness. And that as for me and my household, we would serve God. I just don't see that happening. And I've called out to God, God. It's like he's not even listening. So I go through the motions. 
but because I don't see happening what I thought should have happened by now, doubt has crept in. And the enemy has stolen. Why? Because now I doubt. I'm just not sure no more. What happened? The lion roared. I froze in my tracks. And I braced myself for impact. Instead of doing like King David. Instead of racing to the lion. And ripping it apart by its jaws. And so the vision goes. Jerusalem went through this problem. They had so much stuff. They've gotten away from God. They put other things before God. It happens today. We don't want to admit it. And when somebody, when somebody does preach about it, we get upset. Our church attendance isn't when you first got saved. Our church attendance isn't, uh, isn't like when you, until you married that person. Then it changed. And now we put arts and crafts and children's and soccer game and, and everything else before God. And we think it's okay. But we forget God is a jealous God. And isn't it funny how the world schedules everything that we enjoy doing with our family on a Sunday? He's not stupid. It's, it's that way for a reason. People stay home to watch football. Football. Instead of coming into God's house. And they can't figure out why they can't hear from God and why their life is a mess. I'm not trying to be hard. I'm making observations that are true. Are you getting any of this? Just, and then they, if that doesn't work, they've, tried, they've talked churches into bringing football in, <laughs> into the church. Well, why don't we just put up some stripper poles, some fog lights. It'll increase the offerings at least. It doesn't make sense. Now, we think, well, that's kind of an extreme. No, that's what's actually happening is we've replaced things and activities with God, and it's always on His day. And so this is what happened to Jerusalem. Their priorities got mixed. Somehow or another, they convinced themselves, well, it's my only day off. I should be able to do what I want you to do. Preacher, don't get into my face and tell me I need to be in church. Okay, well, when you're in the hospital, don't call the preacher whose church you didn't go to to come to you. Call your golf buddies. Now, I'm not trying to be hard. It's an observation. Go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Procrastination. Putting things off. What happened? You lost your vision. You talk about it once in a while. When you do, tears come to your eye, but you're not doing nothing about it. Why? The love is gone. The music's not. The song's no longer in your heart. And so now the vision got attacked and really doesn't matter no more. And so we go through the motions. And what has happened? The roaring lion has roared and he's stolen something from us. And so what happens is our faith is being refined. God is trying to say, do you really believe what I promised you? Do you really believe what you say you believe? Or are you going to succumb to the madness that the enemy tries to bring into your life? It's a progressive takedown of Christianity. I'm going to attack you in your love. I'm going to convince you God doesn't love you. I'm going to take the song out of your heart. Then I'm going to take the vision from you. And you're going to become a helpless, hopeless Christian. And what he's done, he's made us POWs in this war that we're in. And so we just go through the motions. But the song's not there. Oh my God, look at Sister So and so. I just, God, she gets on my nerves. I wish she would just. My husband, man, it's just. <laughs> if God would just permit one day where we could kill the spouse day. See, when we choose to stay victims of our past, the vision begins to fade. You find more believers looking backwards at what happened to them and missing what God is doing now and looking to the future. Always looking over their shoulder. This is the way I was treated. This is what was done to me. This is how I was spoken to. This is what they didn't do to me. As I was growing up, my mama, my daddy, my school, my ex, 
Now, that's not to minimize what we've gone through, but that's where the enemy wants you to stay. He wants you to stay in that valley of trauma. And God says, I don't want you in the valley. I want you on the mountaintop with me. But if your vision is gone, well, I'd like to keep going on with Jesus, but I just can't get these incidences out of my mind. What does it say? You. Not the devil. You. You disqualified yourself from the kingdom. And so what does the enemy do? The enemy can't make you, the enemy can't get you disqualified, but he can get you to disqualify yourself. He can't do nothing to you. Colossians says all his weaponry has been taken. The only weapon Satan has, according to the book of Revelation, is deception. Can I get you to believe a lie? How do I get you to believe a lie? I'm going to make you overthink and I'm going to make you feel the wrong things. So when you do counseling and you talk about, well, I think and I feel, that doesn't work. Because your thinking and your feeling could be cluttered because of the dirty filters that you developed as you were growing up. So we can't talk about how you think and feel. Let's lay out the facts, what's actually happened. And so what the enemy does is he comes and, well, I'm just going to steal your love. Evidently, God doesn't love you or else you'd be out of this by now. I'm going to steal that praise out of your mouth. I'm going to get that song out of your heart. Now you don't have any problems listening to worldly music again. I'm going to take that vision from you. God's not going to do anything with you. You're too old too disabled you can't function like you used to well that's good you know what I've learned when I'm weak he's strong I've learned the weaker I get the stronger he does it through me I don't like it I'd like to have the strength that I did when I was 30 years old I'd like to be able to do the things when I was 35 years old I'd like to be able to do the things when I was 40 and 45 years old Heck, I'd like to do the things even when I was 50 years old. Oh, I'd love to. Yay, hallelujah. Let's charge. But it would be me doing it. But when I'm weak, the more, what John the Baptist said it best, Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. And so it happens that fiery trial comes. I'm going to get you to doubt. Boy, by the time I'm through with you, young lady, you're going to be doubting so much, you're just going to quit reading your Bible. You're not going to worship. You're not going to get anything out of it. Why don't you just take up fishing? Why don't you just do arts and crafts? Just find a replacement. Why? You've gone through too much. God doesn't care. And so now the vision is no longer there. Am I talking to anybody? So, we always, we're always looking behind at what happened. And we're missing out on what God is trying to do now. Now, faith is. Can I say this? Many church folks have allowed their refusal to move past their yesterdays that I can't get past my yesterday's pains and sufferings, my problems. They've allowed their past to disqualify them from the kingdom. I didn't say that. It's written in the book of Luke. You put your hand to the plow, keep on plowing. But when you are plowing, when you're doing something for the king and the kingdom, and you start looking back, and you take your hands on the plow, and you want to go back and undo what was done, he said, you disqualified yourself. Turn to someone and say, John, Pastor John didn't write that. Anything that I wrote, you'll be found in the book of John. <laughs> and so what happens? We lose our vision. Every, every moment now leads us further and further away from the vision. And so the smelting process becomes evident by our acting out behaviors. You can tell your love is gone. How? Well, you no longer come to church like you used to. When you first got saved, you went to church every time. You didn't dare want to miss a thing. 
you were up here dancing, being a fool. Oh, Lord, that chicken in the corn pond, getting it on. Putting your hand up, worshiping. Oh, mighty God. You didn't care if it sounded good or if you were a joyful noiser. It's not there no more. Why? Love's gone. Praise is gone. Affected the division. Can I give you the fourth thing the enemy tries to do? See, we like to think we're all, all right because we pop in occasionally to check in with the big man upstairs. But the church is now more backslidden than ever before because we've replaced praise and worship with concerts. We've replaced the holy presence of God when his presence filled the sanctuary with smoke with artificial fog and lights. Are you getting this? And there's no longer an emphasis on the word changing us. The emphasis is on, can I say something to make you feel good? The fourth end thing the enemy tries to steal is your testimony. Everybody say testimony. How you talk about yourself is the picture that people see when they think of you. Some people are always complaining. And so people around them will see them as a complainer. They don't want anything to do with them. Some people are very harsh, strong, and critical. Don't you dare not just rip your... You better... And so you painted a picture of yourself. You're a hard person. Now, psychologically, when that happens, I know you've got a lot of damage and you've made an inner vow telling yourself, I'll be darned if I ever let anybody do this to me again. But that hardness wears off after about 20 years, and then you fall apart. Because you can't be the God of your own life. Because maintenance takes work. Trying to make sure all the kids are doing right, the spouse is doing right, the job is going right, the finances are right, everybody loves you, and if they don't love you, well, just rain on them. And so the enemy wants to take your testimony. He wants you to change your words. Well, I know God's a healer, but... Well, I know God will provide, but... The thing I can't stand is at funerals. Well, you know, God took the little one because he needed another angel. I will choke you until you see Jesus if you blame God for that child's death. Are you getting anything? Go with me to Psalms 66, verse 16. Is this helping anybody? Look at somebody say, he's like Mr. Rogers. He's in my neighborhood. Psalm 66, verse 16. See, here's where I want to get at. I want to, as we take off this year, I want you to get your love back. If you need to forgive Dumbo because he's a Dumbo, forgive the Dumbo. If you need to get your praise back, so you're going in Walmart, what a mighty God we serve. And then if you have to have your own rapture, oh, Lord, that chicken in the corn pone. Oh, Lord, they bring it on home. Whatever you got to do. I want you to get your vision back. I want your testimony, your confession that you speak. Well, you know, our marriage has really been, and I just can't stand my husband. I can't stand my wife, you know, and our finances. And, you know, it's just wowsy, wowsy, woo, woo, you know. Well, I know God's a healer, but I've been going through this and having a healer. And so it, it's evident in the way we talk. Psalm 66, verse 16. All believers, come here and listen. Let me tell you what God did for me. That should be our conversation. Hey, listen, let me tell you what God did for me. God didn't let us go to this minister's conference because he knew a baby was on the way. Our 11th one, I might add. Are you getting any of this? Let me tell you what God did. I remember driving down the road and blood filled up his eye. I'm driving in a construction zone. All of a sudden, I can't see. I'm freaking out. I go home. I said, honey, I, I can't see out of this eye. I saw the blood literally just going up. 
freaked out. All right, let me gain my composure. Went to the hospital. Oh, you had this. We need to drain the blood. Okay, drain the blood. Good, let's drain the blood. You going to hang me upside down? No, it'll, it'll take some time. A couple of years passed, the blood hadn't drained. So I said, well, let's add a stent. Okay, stent. So now I've got the blood draining. A couple of more years passed. About five years, the blood finally drained. And they said, well, let's go ahead and do surgery on your eye. We'll go ahead and repair that, and you should have your vision back. Okay, well, amen. Praise God. Sounds good. It's only been five years. Now, during that five years, I went up and down. Discouragement, disappointment. I saw, I, I saw boards on the outside of the church windows, closed for sale sign. Are you getting this? I thought, gee, God can't use a one-eyed preacher right now, can he? And then all of a sudden, I got a hold of myself, and I'm, I, I'm being seduced by the devil to give up. What do I need to do? Well, if I can't see that well, because this eye makes everything look fuzzy, why don't I start writing because I can't see? Are you getting this? So I started writing books. I started making more manuals, more study guides. I made the adjustments and kept on. Now, when I went in for surgery, the doctor's cutting at my eye. Now, you're, you're still awake, but you're not awake. You know, and so I heard him start sighing heavily and breathing, and I thought this is not good. It turned out that the blood had coagulated to my lens, and so I was going to have to have a lens replacement. When he did that, I could feel the scalpel going across my eye. I could feel it. I couldn't do nothing though. Did a lens replacement, and I'm thinking, praise God. And I, couple of weeks I'll be healed and I'll be able to get my vision back finally after about five years one day I'm sitting at home and somebody takes a chainsaw inside my skull and just starts swinging that chainsaw so much pain shot through my body I told Karen I need to go to the emergency room and you need to knock me out because all the blood vessels had exploded in my head went to the emergency room I told the doctors I didn't ask them I said you need to knock me out they looked at each other <laughs> I looked at Karen I said you need to knock me out we need to knock him out so they knocked me out because the pain of this chainsaw being twirled around inside my head was so painful so excruciating and so when I when they finally you know did what they could do I had a doctor's appointment and said, Mr. Pelzar, there's, there's nothing medically that we can do anymore with your eye. Your left eye has grown stronger over the five years. Okay? But I, I can't see things clearly. If I put on glasses, it, you know, there's still a haze there. I said, I'm sorry. There's, there's nothing we can do medically. So I found my testimony. I told him, you know what? I do know someone. I do know someone who can still fix this for me. His name is Jesus. Now, my doctors are believers. All my doctors are believers. And he said, amen. And he looked at me, and he said, you've got such incredible faith. Well, what else do I have if not my faith? Are you getting this? So I'm, I'm standing and believing God. If I don't get a replacement, I don't want to look creepy, but if I, if I don't get a replacement, I'll get a new one. Yeah. Are you getting this? Now, there's times, according to what's in the air, the pollen or whatever, because I've got that stint in there, my eye will really itch, and because of that stint, it feels like somebody's taking a tree limb and is just kind of digging around. And it's very painful, and sometimes it causes like an ice pick feeling through my skull. So what do I do? Well, I'm going to study the word. That's what I do. That's my testimony. Now, did I cry and moan and complain and gripe and fuss and cuss and threaten God? You bet I did. I found out none of those things worked. So I thought, well, that's why he's called Yahweh, because I can't do it my way. So I had to do it his way. So we keep on plowing, keep on doing what we're doing, make adjustments as we go. 
Now, every day, a thought will come where the enemy is saying, I'm going to take out that other eye. Then what you going to do? Now, here's the cool thing. I go see my eye doctor to, to monitor my left eye. And, and this is, now God is my witness. My wife is a witness. My eye doctor appointments last for about 15 minutes. And it goes like this. My doctor comes in. He goes, okay, your eyes are fine. Now, let's talk about the Bible. He spends about two seconds. Yeah, your eyes are fine. And the rest of the time we talk about the Word of God. Why? Because the testimony is still there. Now, we lose our testimony when we go through stuff. We become hard and cynical. We give in, we give up. Turn to someone and say, don't lose your testimony. When you start talking more about you and the things that you've gone through, it shows that... <laughs> It shows that you don't have, uh, you, you, when you start talking about you and the things that you've gone through, you start giving glory to God because now it's about you. It affects your, your, your witness and your testimony. And now you're trying to convince people that you work with, hey, why don't you come to church with me? And they're thinking, so I can be grouchy like you? So I can be a complainer like you? So I can talk about my husband, my wife, like you talk about your husband and your wife. I don't think I want to go meet this Jesus fella that you say that you love. Are you getting any of this? In the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 45. A good person produces good things from the treasure of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasure of an evil heart. Now, here's what I'm trying to get. Here's my point. What you say flows from what is in your heart. You know, you have people sometimes, they'll say something, a verbal jab, and then they'll just say, just kidding. They're not. That's what's in their heart. What you say will come from your heart. And so the smelting process is to remove the impurities. Well, you know, you say you love God, but you can't stand people. That's hating your brother. That's murder. You're not qualified. Well, you say you love God, but you won't lift your hands and praise and worship Him because you don't like the song. Well, you say you love God. He's given you a vision. It's been 17 years and you still haven't done nothing about it. You say you love God, but it doesn't come out in the words that you say. You say you believe Him and his promises, but it doesn't come out. What happened? The enemy roared, we froze in place, and he stole that from us. But because we go through the motions, we still think we're okay. But it's not the motions that God judges, it's the heart. Because the Bible says, I look at the heart. You can fake it until you make it all you want to. But when you stand before me, you ain't going to fake it. Because I'm going to look at the heart. And I want us to get our heart right for the beginning of the year so this will be a year of prosperity. This will be a year of blessing that we don't have that little secret sin like David said, Lord, if there are any secret sins in my life, remove them from me as far as the east is from the west. I don't want anything standing in the way between me and you. <coughs> if my love is gone, if I got an attitude towards people, I repent and I'm going to make every effort if I want to run, I'm going to stick around. If I can't stand him, I'm just going to cuddle up to him. Hello? If I've lost my first love, you know what? I'm going to set my priorities right. Sunday morning church, Sunday night church, Wednesday church, and anything else between church. What do I do between then? Jesus, 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 Jesus. Church is when he talks to me. Church is when I have fellowship. Church is when I grow. Church is when I'm instructed. The church has grown lukewarm. Why? Our testimony has gone. Our praise. Oh, how I love you. Is gone. I just don't know what God wants me to do. Our vision is gone. I've been believing God for things 
incredible things that, that I thought, there's no way. There's no way. There's just no way. It's stupid to think about it. There's just no way. Been believing God for years. Felt like he told me in the very beginning, this is going to be here, this is going to be there, you're going to be doing this. And far from it. Don't have the finances, don't have the resources, don't have the troops to get it all done. It's just far from it. And the devil would love nothing better and say, why don't you just give up on that silly notion? But this year, instead of making a New Year's resolution, instead of me making a promise, I said, Lord, why don't you fill up my chalkboard and find out, I want to find out what you want to do in me, and I'll comply to your resolutions. Are you getting any of this? And so the enemy wants to steal your testimony. The impurities that, that uh, the smelting process, uh, you know, comes to the surface. Now, what are you doing now? How, how can you tell the impurities? Well, now you fuss and cuss and complain. You didn't used to do that. You stopped cussing altogether. Now you're cussing again. You stop fussing and complaining. You were just saying, Jesus has got it. Now you're just telling everybody your business. Am I talking to anybody? Huh? Our words reveal our hearts. Can I give you some more? Go. Uh, the fifth thing is, he will steal your character. Your character. Character is what you are is who you are when no one's looking. It's easy to come to church and amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I love you, Jesus. Character is what you're doing when no one's looking. Your words and actions reveal your character. You can tell who's God in a person's life by what they talk about the most. What will they defend when you talk about what they love the most? They, will they defend their Jesus that way? Now, we'll defend our movie stars. We'll defend our athletes. We'll defend our things. But will you defend Jesus? When someone talks about the church you go to, will you defend it? I, I, are you getting it? I, I'm, not on a, I, I'm not on a soapbox. Tr I'm trying to show you. These are the areas where we get attacked. And we got to remember, the devil is subtle. He's not going to go, here I am. Get ready for a slap. He's going to sneak in. He's going to work on that love thermometer. He's going to turn that thing down so you're cold. He's going to work on your praise. Ah, you know what? Things have gotten kind of hard and sour. He's going to work on your testimony. And here he's working on your character. Why? Because your conversation has changed when you first got saved. Go with me to the book, 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother and sister, you find this in relationships. Husbands and wives can't stand each other. I don't know why I married this thing. But they come to church, hallelujah. <laughs> I just want you to use me, hallelujah. And then you go home, That's Jekyll and Hyde Christianity. He attacks your character. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, Thinking nothing of it. He's a liar. I just want God to use me. Well, you can't serve your spouse a glass of tea. Huh? Just thinking nothing of it. Okay? He is what? A liar. Turn to someone and say, liar, liar, pants on fire. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he doesn't see? So what happens? Your character. Your words reveal your character, and so now your character is questionable. Well, you know, they, they, let, me, let me give you an example. That this is what I use as a pastor. You know, I'm always looking for, for people who are kingdom-minded. What can I do for the king? 
And so when I consider a person, you know, can this person get along with, with everybody? And sometimes you want to consider a person, but they can't get along with everybody. Well, I don't think I can work with him. I don't think I can work with her. Well, what does that mean? You're not qualified to be a leader. We've had, we've had uh, issues where sometimes parents wouldn't let them, their kids go to the teen service or the children's service because an incident happened where the, where, where the pastors that were there that I have entrusted to help watch over the flock where the pastors over there had to bring a correction and the parents only heard the side of the, the sobbing child story instead of saying, you know what? I'll have a talk with my child too and I'll let them know that if you get a spanking at church, you're going to get a spanking at home. Not us. <gasps> Not my baby. Well, you just don't have to go there anymore. What'd you teach? Rebellion pays off. And so what happened? They disqualify themselves. Because why? That's a flaw in their character. So you can't use that character. You can't use that person because if, if they say they want to be in leadership but they got a problem with someone, well, you can't lead them then. Are you getting this? And so the enemy wants to steal our character. When your testimony changes from, from focusing on the things of God to rehearsing your trials and your, your tribulations and, 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 you know, your issues and your problems that you think you have, uh, then, you know, your character has become stolen because we're told to love everybody. Well, I love I just can't work with them. That's not love. Please. Well, I like them, but I don't love you. Like is a prelude to love. Don't give me that either. Are you getting any of this? And I want us to be refined this morning. I want us to say, Jesus, I know like the Apostle Paul, I am not perfect. I have not reached it. But this one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to forget this crazy 2017 past. I'm going to forget what they said, what they did, what they didn't do, what they didn't say. And I'm going to press on this year for the high calling of God. I will be exceedingly abundantly blessed above and beyond all that I can think by the end of this year. Devil, watch my smoke. That's what I'm shooting for. So I got to make some love adjustments. Why? Because some folks, you just... Mm, you see them and inside you go... Mm, you develop this tick. And, mm, mm, mm. Hmm? I got to find my praise. I got to turn highway to hell to streets of gold. Don't you start singing highway to hell in your brain. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I could speak all the languages of earth and angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. When you think it's okay to stay mad at your spouse or others, something's been stolen. Your character has been affected because you think because you're justified has been stolen. Your character has been stolen. Am I talking to anybody? First Corinthians 13, 2. Can I have a better amen than that? Thank you. I'm glad I took up offerings first. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood of all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but did you know that word but cancels out everything you just read? But love others, but if I didn't love others, I would be nothing. Doing, listen to this, ready? Doing godly things does not mean you have godly character. Well, my boyfriend, he's going to church. No, he's trying to get something else out of you. Well, he stopped coming to church when we got married because honeymoon's over. He got what he wanted. If you didn't find him in church, he's not going to stay in church once you get married. Let me say it again for this side. If you didn't find him in church coming on his own, he's not going to come on his church when you get married. He's only going with you to honeymoon you. I don't know where that came from, but that's for somebody. 
So if I could do all these godly things, Master, did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we do all these wonderful things in your name? Depart from me. I don't even know you. I don't even know who you are. I don't know your character. Are you getting this? Let me give you a joke. In the Pope was traveling around the world. And uh, he came to a certain country, and there was a major accident. Somebody hit the Pope mobile. Turned out to be a lawyer. See, you know the lawyer, lawyer, you know his character. So the Pope and the lawyer ended up dying. So they're standing in heaven before Peter. And so Peter says, well, I want the two of you, Mr. Pope and, and Mr. Lawyer, to come with me. And so the, the Peter, St. Peter's escorting them to their, to their new places in heaven. So he takes the Pope. It's a little bitty shack. It's a one-room shack. Okay? There's a bowl for washing there. There's just a cot. There's one chair. It's, it's just a shack. And Peter says, Pope, this is yours. He takes the lawyer on down the road, and they're approaching a beautiful mansion. There's a fountain in front of that thing, and, and Peter says, uh, this is going to be your place. Beautiful mansion. They walk in. It's, it's got uh, you know exotic furniture and uh, exotic paintings, and it's got finery of gold, and it's monogrammed with the lawyer's initials and everything like that, and it's just the finest of the finest that heaven could produce. Now, the Pope is in, a, in, you know, is in the shack, and so the lawyer's in this fine, beautiful mansion. And so the lawyer asks, he says, I don't understand. How come the Pope just got a one-room shack with a bed and a chair, and I have this wonderful, beautiful, exquisite mansion? And Peter said, well, we have a lot of popes up here, but we don't have any lawyers. <laughs> Why? Because when I said lawyer, you immediately associate it with character. Are you getting it? How you behave, how you act, how you talk, how you carry yourself reveals your character. You can pretend like you're nice, but people, people, can, people can smell a phony. Look at some and say, people know a phony when they see one. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't have, if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. <coughs> the very nature and character of God is love. Can I give you one more and quit? Is anybody learning anything? How many of you, as we're ministering this, the Holy Ghost is going, boing, 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 boing. That's you. Boing, boing, boing. How many of you are just not going to say anything this morning? You're, you're, just in, you're just in Egypt on the river denial. Okay. Number six. Oh, please. I get, I get groans from Jerry. Really? The sixth thing the enemy tries to steal once he steals everything else is he will steal your fear of the Lord. Turn to someone and say, brace yourself, this is going to hurt. He will steal your fear of the Lord. The step-by-step -step dissection by starting starts to, to bring you to this point. Your love, your praise, your testimony, your vision, your character is all just a chipping away by the enemy, killing you slowly and methodically to get you to this point where he can steal your fear of the Lord. You've gone through so much and you feel like life is now unfair. And you feel like you're stuck and you can't do anything about it. That the fear of the Lord begins to go and you no longer care. You don't care no more. You don't care if you go to church or not. You don't care if people like you or not. You don't care, you know. You, you just don't care. It's about you and your survival skills. You just don't care. You can hear
hear a word preached and you know the Holy Spirit is talking to you. You just don't care. Why? The fear of the Lord's gone. Go with me, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 27. How can you tell the fear of the Lord has been stolen from you? The fear of the Lord is a spring of living water, so you won't go off drinking from poisoned wells. When you can compromise or make excuses for the things of God that you used to do when you first got saved, when you can compromise and make excuses or justify, your fear of the Lord has been stolen. You don't care no more. You care if we go to church or not. Let's just stay home and rest. It's my only day off. I, I, I don't care about getting involved. I, I, I don't want to use my ministry gift I, I, anymore. I, I got burned in our last church, and I, 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 I don't want to volunteer, and I, I don't want to get up there, and I, I, just, I, I, just, I, I just don't care. I just, just come here, feed me, I'll put some money in the bucket, and then leave me alone. What happened? Your fear of the Lord has gone. Why? Because when you first got saved, you came to church. Open the door! Now you don't have a problem coming late now you can call in sick you got a sniffle or a headache and you call in sick I can't make it tonight pastor well what happened to the scripture call for the elders of the church and they'll pray, lay, pray and lay hands on you and, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick well you know I'm just you know me and Excedrin we got it I don't know about you when I was growing up and I first got saved I'd go to church every time well, I didn't want to miss nothing if I wasn't doing well, I'm, come on, come on. I was like, come on, pastor, give an altar call. Come on, buddy, lay some hands on me now. Come on. Now we get a headache or a sniffle or something. Oh, I can't make it. What happened? Well, the fear of the Lord. It's being tampered with. The enemy's trying to steal it. Turns on and say, it's really quiet in this Baptocostal church. The impurities come to the surface. And so now, you don't have a problem being late. You don't have a problem skipping. And so now, anything can be used as an excuse. What's happened? There's no longer a fear of the Lord. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. I can study at home. I can praise at home. I can do this at home. But God established it. And so the fear of the Lord's gone. Are you getting any of this? Turn to someone and say, it's tight, but it's right. Revelations chapter 3, verse 16. You're stale. Jesus, God is talking to the church. You're stale. You're stagnant. You make me want to vomit. The word stale means you're no longer performing well because of having done or gone through something for too long. So we become stale. We become a victim instead of living victoriously. This thing has worn me out. I'm tired. I don't do this no more. I'm aching. I'm hurting. Now, the only time I've ever... Uh, uh, now, this is just me. I don't know about you. But the only time I've, I've ever, uh, uh, you know, not gone to church is, is if I had projectiles coming from one end or the other. That was it. Other than that, it didn't matter. We're going to come. We're going to do what we need to do. Why? We got a kingdom to advance. It's not about me. It's about him. And when I get up there, I know the Holy Ghost is going to take over. And, and then we'll just go through the motions. And afterwards, I can go home, take a nap. Somebody, please get me a hamburger before I do. Am I talking to anybody? So what happens? The fear of the Lord. You're apathetic. You don't care. You're stale. You've gone through so much stuff according to what you've gone through so much stuff. It doesn't bother you no more. You're just now into pain management. Instead of turning over the pain to him. I'm going to make my way to church because I know they're going to do something. It says you're stagnant. What does stagnant mean? Stagnant means you're motionless. You're not moving forward anymore. You're, 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 you're no longer involved. You have an unpleasant... Stagnant means you have an unpleasant smell. 
as a consequence of what you're going through. No wonder God said sometimes in the scriptures that their, their smell of their city has come up as, as, you know, before God. And so now the fear of the Lord's gone when you don't care no more. You can make excuses. You've made replacements. You can justify. When the preacher talks about it, you get mad at him. You will accuse him of being judgmental. You will accuse your pastor of being critical and harsh. And all the pastor's trying to do is I'm trying to remind you, hey, there's a possibility you may be backsliding and you're not aware of it. How can you tell? The fear of the Lord has been stolen. I just don't care no more. I don't care if we go to church or not. I don't care if we're late because I can't stand the song service. I don't mind leaving early. Now, we don't do that at movies. We'll give Hollywood more attention and credit than we do God's house. Matter of fact, we'll make sure we get to the movies early because we've got to get our popcorn and get a good seat. What's going on? Well, church, the fear of the Lord is gone. And so we've become no different than the society around us. We can pick and choose. Then we can't figure out, why isn't God moving in my life? Because I called out to my lover, Jesus. Lover of my soul, where are you? He got tired of waiting. Why? Because he knows my heart's not there. My praise is gone. I, I just can't seem to hear from God anymore. The direction, I, I, I don't know if that was me or if that was late night pizza. Just, I, I, I don't know. And, 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 you know, obviously, and just, I just, man, I've just gone through so much. Now my testimony is changing. And then so now people will associate me by the things I've been saying. And now, and now I just, you know what? Rain on it. I don't care. It doesn't matter anyways. I don't care about you. I'm going to divorce you because you, you don't make me happy no more. You're disposable. You're like a, a Dixie cup. Just crumple you up and throw you away. You know what? Just rain on it. God didn't save so-and-so and, -so and he, he let them die and Obviously, he doesn't care, so I, I'm, you know, I'm just going to cross my arms, and I'm just going to stomp my foot, and I'm, I'm just not going to church no more. You know, rain on it. My, my first love is gone. I, you know, I, I'll get there when I get there. Don't, don't tell me I need to be there. Who do you think you are? The pastor who watches over your soul. I'm not trying to be hard or harsh. These are the subtleties that the enemy uses to attack us. And when the fear of the Lord has been stolen, you really don't give a rip. And when somebody says something about it, you get all bristly. How dare you talk about my church attendance? I have a right to because I'm the pastor. Are you getting any of this? And so the church is putting on the garments of the world. And we're told... Don't be friends with the world because if you're friends with the world, you become an enemy of God. And so now our priorities have shifted. Jesus is no longer the first love. Why? Because it all started with a fiery trial. Sometimes the exact opposite happens. Sometimes God blesses you with what you've been looking for. And eventually that blessing will talk you out of the things of God. I've seen couples do this. He's going to church faithfully. She's going to church faithfully. They get hooked up. They come to church faithfully. And then after a while, they just stop. He's involved in the ministry. She talks him out of it. She's involved in the ministry. He talks her out of it. What's going on? Well, the fear of the Lord. The lion roared. It may, it, it may have taken a while to take us down. It may have taken a while to take you down. But you're down. How can you tell? The fear of the Lord's not there no more. I don't care. I don't care what the preacher has to say. I don't, I, I, you know, I know that's written in the word, but 
I've got reasons and excuses. Did you see how he treated me? Did you see what she did? Uh uh. Mama didn't raise no dummy. I don't got to put up with that. Well, yeah, according to the Bible, you do. We all have a cross to bear. Are you getting any of this? Am I trying to be hard or harsh? No. I'm making some observations. Now, some of you will be able to take this and you'll say, you know, sometime uh, this coming up week, Lord, is there any areas in my life where the enemy has stolen? Has my love been stolen? Has my praise been stolen? Can I give you another verse? Thank you. I'm going to anyways. Two more. So the impurity, what happens? The impurity of apathy. We just don't care no more. Apathy or lu- apathy is another way of saying of lukewarm. You don't care. Okay? Lukewarm rises to the surface. And, you, and, and so you get defensive and, and you'll get mad. And, you, you, you know, when it's addressed, you'll even get aggressive. And you'll even make threats. Well, I'm just not coming back no more. Okay? Philippians 1.6, message translation. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that God, who started this great work in you, would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. See, God wants to finish what he started within you. Satan wants you to doubt. Isaiah 48, verse 10. Do you see what I've done? I've refined you, but not without fire. I tested you like silver in the furnace of affliction. Out of myself, simply because of who I am, I do what I do. I have my reputation to keep up. I'm not playing second fiddle to either gods or people. See, the purpose of the refinement is so that we would put God first again. So that we would fall in love with Jesus. My old pastor used to sing the corniest song I've ever heard in my life. And he thought he was just Pavarotti singing it at the opera hall. Listen to the But he used to sing, I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Anybody know that old song? It gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. And we have forgotten Why? Because of fiery trials. Something took place. And it began a progressive dissection. We were just slowly, methodically being worked on by the enemy. We still go through the motions. But how many of you know going through the motions doesn't mean your heart's there? You could be in a room of crowded people and, and, and be surrounded by all sorts of people who say they love you but still feel alone and unwanted. And so if the enemy, if he can get us to doubt and quit and apathy and make excuses and reasons and justifications and pull you out of church, and you know, uh, where, which is the body where you get your strength and your feedings and your fellowships and everything else, if he can get you to methodically just, I'm going to take your love. God doesn't love you. Look what you're going through. I'm going to take your praise. I don't know why you're singing that song. You have nothing to praise about. Have you seen your life? Your life is a mess. I'm going to take your testimony. I'm going to take your vision. I'm going to make sure you change the way you talk about God. Instead of rejoicing, I'm, I'm, uh, you're going to say, well, you know, it's warfare, it's warfare, it's warfare, it's warfare, it's warfare. There is no war. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The, the Bible never tells us to war against demons. It tells us to rebuke them and resist the devil. That's it. But we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That doesn't mean we go after them. They're trying to come after us. Read the scriptures. Come on. Are you getting this? And so through a progressive stage, we begin to just get away from the things of God. 
church no longer excites us? Well, you know, it's just kind of boring. I feel like every message you're coming on to me. Well, maybe that's how God wants you to hear it. Because he said he'll send prophets and teachers who will tell you what you need to hear and not want to hear. Well, you know, I just don't get anything out of praise and worship. Well, instead of complaining, join. If you can't join, buy an instrument. If you can't buy an instrument, pray for the praise and worship team. <laughs> you're asking me to get involved. Yes, that's kingdom. You're either building the kingdom or you're building on your empire. I'm not trying to be hard or harsh, but in order for me to launch us into 2018 and begin to experience the goodness of God, we got to take a mirror and we got to say, has my love been affected? Is my praise gone? Is my testimony, my vision? Does the preacher make me mad every time I come to church? I hope I do. Why? Because I know you're paying attention. He just makes me mad by the things I say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why? Because that's the pastor's job. To encourage, exhort, rebuke, correct, uplift. I can't tell where the enemies hit you the most because we, have, we keep secrets. Everybody in here has a secret. Right? Sheep do not go, mm -hmm. it's either amen or no. Everybody's got a secret. Okay? We've all got secrets. But God knows the secrets. But the enemy would love nothing more than to play on us and to just take us apart, to get you to doubt, to finally get you to quit. And when you're ready to quit or you can make excuses, the fear of the Lord's gone. May I encourage you some of you think, well, after all that, good Lord. <laughs> that if you've recognized one of these enemies, and if it pushed your button, I'm glad it did. If you recognize one of these areas that the enemy's been working on you, before the month is over, you get out some communion elements, you get a notepad, you get your Bible, and you say, Lord, I'm not going to leave this table until my relationship with you is renewed as if you were my first love all over again. Tell me something. Speak to me. What do I need to do? Because God loves us. His love is never failing. He's not out to get us. He's on our side. But the devil would love nothing better than to convince us that we're okay and on our way when we may have stumbling blocks in our life. Did you learn something this morning? Give the Lord a hand clap if you did. Now, here's what I want to do. If you've recognized an area and you're ready to start on it today, I'd like for you to stand where you're at. If you've recognized an area, I'm standing. I'm standing. I was the first one to stand. I'm standing. You recognized, whether it's your love, your praise, your testimony, your character, your vision, fear of the Lord. You recognized it. And you're saying today by standing up, Lord, thank you for showing me that in my life. I may not like what the preacher said, but I recognize it now as a thorn that the enemy has put into my side. You're saying by standing, God, I want you and me to work together. Show me the adjustments I need to make so I'm back on track. So the enemy will have no place in my life. Lord, I surrender. You're saying I'm going to surrender every area of my life that this is affected. And in order to show you that I am sincere, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what I felt like doing. I felt like hiding, but I'm going to come out in the open. I didn't want to get involved, but I'm going to be there at every fellowship. I didn't want to serve, but now I'm going to be the best servant the kingdom's ever seen. I'm not going to bury my gift. I'm going to forgive my husband. 
I'm going to let go of those not headed people from the past. Whatever, whatever your situation is. By you standing, you're saying, I'm ready to move on. And it's going to start with a prayer. So I'm going to ask that what we pray that you believe he's going to do. And it's going to happen this year. So by the end of this year, you'll be able to be like Abraham, who was blessed exceedingly abundantly above. And the Bible says that he had much wealth and possessions. I want you to live in abundance. It's time to stop living in the valley. And it's time to come to the mountaintop. So let's say this together. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Expose what the enemy has stolen. Restored unto me in Jesus' name. And that's it. That's it. All you did was ask him. Lord Jesus, just come into my heart. Show me what the enemy's been doing. And restore me. Back where I need to be with you. Do you receive that this morning? Give the Lord a hand clap offering. Let you go because he's been working on you methodically. So when you don't feel like going to church, you need to be the first one here. When you don't feel like getting involved, you need to sign up for everything. When you don't, listen, when your husband looks at you,